Good evening, everyone. It's very good to see all of you out tonight. Good to see uh, people that I know, and uh, good to see people that know me. I'm not sure how I know about that, how I feel about that, but uh, we're going to carry on anyway. If you have your Bibles this evening, I encourage you to have those out. We're here to study God's Word. We're here to read from the Scriptures. If you came hearing something else, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Uh, 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, is where we're going to center our study tonight. If you have a marker in your Bible, that would be a good place to leave it. We're, of course, if you talk about 1 Samuel 17, we're going to be looking uh, at the life of David, and in particular, the incident between himself and Goliath. Just to give you kind of a a wrap-up of what we've done so far today. Our theme is the army of God, and we're looking at the great soldiers that we find in Scripture. And the first three soldiers in that list that we're going to talk about were literal soldiers. They were soldiers that carried the sword or carried... Uh, the, led the armies of God in actual battle and actual warfare. So that's why the first lesson we talked about Joshua, and we talked about the idea that if God is on your side, if you are fighting for the army of the Lord, then you are absolutely assured of victory. There's not a matter of if God can win or can we win if God's on our side. Those are not good questions. It's a matter of are you on God's side or not, because His side always wins. Of course, we went from there to the, to the study of Gideon, where we take that, that great proclamation of God's assurance and God's victory, and we make it meet the road of reality of what it says in the Scriptures about the armies of God. And the simple fact is, we're outnumbered. The simple fact about when God fights on an army's behalf, He oftentimes reduces their number. He makes the enemy bigger than you are. So that he can be glorified when victory is had. So the victory will not be had by those who fought it. But instead they will be had on God's behalf. On on behalf of their Lord. If you're going to talk about great soldiers in scripture. I'm not sure how you can avoid King David. Probably it would be in the argument for the greatest Israelite soldier to ever pick up the sword. There were soldiers that were known for killing lots of people. There were soldiers that were known for mighty deeds and doing this, that, or the other, but none of them really, honestly, hold a candle to David. He arrives on the scene in 1 Samuel 17, a shepherd boy, and defeats the ironclad giant from Gath, Goliath. He surpasses King Saul in the minds of the people. You remember the little song they came up with with Saul and David. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Remember Saul took great offense to that. King Saul being shown up by a relative nobody from the tribe of Judah. Countless military campaigns were won under the leadership of David. And we're going to focus this evening on the first of those victories, the victory over Goliath. We often call this story David and Goliath, do we not? That's even in our our culture. If we say the words David and Goliath, what we're referring to is a David and Goliath type struggle, a massive opponent and an underdog that's not supposed to win, but they do anyway. If you watch college football, that's, you'll, you'll hear it on Saturday, friend. David and Goliath, when a nobody plays a big school. But I want us to consider the story from David's perspective. The story isn't really David and Goliath. The story really centers on David and God. If you look at it from David's perspective and how David words some of the things that he says, Goliath's really not the issue here. It's David and his connection with God. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 37, I have a couple examples of that. David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Of course, Saul replies, Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. Verse 45 of that same chapter. When David approaches the Philistine, we're going to talk about that in a second. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you've defied. David didn't go out empty-handed, but he knew it wasn't the sling and those five stones that were going to win him the victory. He understood it was his connection and his relationship with our God. What we're going to notice as we read through the story of David and Goliath from David's perspective is the absolute total focus that David has on God and the almost just utter lack of focus and concern he has for Goliath. 
that's our topic this evening, David and God, and why that's an appropriate way to look at this, and why learning to focus on God rather than focusing on our enemies is important. Because if we're going to have victory over any enemy, particularly that of Satan, we have to be focused in on God. We have to be a people that have a relationship with our Lord. Just look at the two main protagonists on the Israeli side, or the Israelite side. If you look at Saul as compares to David, looking at it from an outside standpoint, one of these guys should have won. One of them should not have been there at all. King Saul is the one who is supposed to win this victory if you look at it on paper. He's the one that's noted as head and shoulders above all the other Israelites. That either means he was really tall or he was just the best among them. We find this great man of Israel cowering in his tent for 40 days. On the other hand, we find David, a wet behind the ears shepherd boy, just come off from tearing for the sheep, toting supplies for his brothers, walks in and in short order kills Goliath. What's the difference between those two men? It's clearly not military strength. It's clearly not how well armored they were. How long they've been around in the biblical story. None of those things mattered in that fight with Goliath. But here's what did. The difference between Saul and David is that when you see this text and when you read through it, you're going to notice that David focuses on God every single opportunity he gets. And every time Saul has an opportunity, he doesn't. He focuses instead on Goliath. Let's look at those two, shall we? 1 Samuel 17, let's begin reading there in verse 33. If you have your scripture in front of you, I encourage you to turn there. 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, and verse 33. To fill us in on the story so far, David has arrived on the scene. He has made it known that he wishes to kill the Philistine. Word makes it around to Saul, so Saul brings David in to speak with him. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or bear or, and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Look at, da look at Saul's attitude towards David when he expresses his desire to fight, particularly in verse 33. David's response, or Saul's response to David, he's a man of war, you're not. He's prepared for this, you're not. He has armored himself in rather impressive armor when you read the beginning of the chapter. And you have it. He knows what he's doing, and you don't. When you consider armies that fight on God's behalf, when have any of those things ever mattered? When armies fight on God's behalf, when has it ever mattered whether or not they had more people, or they were better armed, or they were better experienced to fight on God's behalf? We saw from Gideon's story this morning, he was a man hiding in a wine press that led the Israelites to victory. It's never been about how well you're equipped. It's never been about who you are or what you're prepared to do. The real problem is Saul forgot about God. Saul has forsaken God in his entire conversation. The only mention of God is in verse 37, which kind of honestly looks kind of like an afterthought. This is sort of like what you say to people, kind of like in the idea of good luck. This is kind of what you say to people like, well, David's got his mind made up. Well, go and the Lord be with you. That's the first mention you find of the Lord from Saul. And the only one. 
the Lord could have been with Saul. Had Saul not already forsaken him a few chapters earlier in the text. But when you look at how David describes the Philistine, it's different. When you look at what David says about Goliath, it shows you where his focus is at. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 26, earlier from where we read just a moment ago. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 26. David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David says a few very significant things in this statement he makes here in verse 26. Number one, he calls to mind the covenant that the Israel had with God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? What is he saying? He's not a Jew. He doesn't have our promises. God's not been on his side. He, God didn't deliver his people from the land of Egypt. He delivered ours. Who is this guy? He doesn't have what we've been promised. He calls to mind that covenant. And he sets a, the, what the Philistine does is opposite with the living God there at the end of the verse. He declares confidently in verse 37 how he's going to defeat Goliath. God spared me from the lion. He spared me from the bear. He'll spare me from that guy too. It's interesting when you look at the text. When you read 1 Samuel 17 and you watch really closely. Goliath is mentioned by name twice by the writer of 1 Samuel. The writer of 1 Samuel also notices that he is a champion. He's called a champion. But how does David refer to Goliath each and every time? The only thing David ever calls him is Philistine. Doesn't call him Goliath. Doesn't call him a champion. Doesn't call him a great man of war or anything else. The only thing David has time to say is the Philistine. To David, Goliath is no different from any other enemy he's come across so far. No different from any lion or any bear that he's encountered during his shepherd work. David is, Goliath is no different from any other enemy because the Lord on the side of David is not different either. The Lord is the one who spared David from those two earlier incidents. And it would be the Lord who would spare him from Goliath of Gath. This begs the question of what great champion do you have, do I have, waiting for us on the spiritual battleground? Thankfully, we don't have a nine-foot-tall giant standing in front of our house shouting. But we do have a roaring lion who prowls about seeking whom he may devour. We have temptations that beat on our door every day saying, you need to give in. You need to quit. Come out and fight me so you'll lose. Are we going to be like Saul and the Israelite army? On the correct side, but not doing the correct thing. Cowering in our tents. Afraid to put our faith in God on the line when it actually counts for something. Christians, young and old, have spent too long staring at Satan. Looking at people who are working for him and with him. Looking at what he's capable of at what he's doing in our world. And we've frankly been afraid to fight him. Afraid to fight him in our own lives. Afraid to fight him in the lives of our families and our children. What's worse? We spent too long tearing each other down. It's bad enough that we have a Goliath to fight. We're stabbing each other in the back. Refusing to forgive one another for things long past. And refusing to work with one another. We have to remind ourselves of the God that we serve, friends. Second Samuel 22. David. On the day the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, from the hand of Saul. David didn't do everything right. David went astray. But David didn't forget who his God was. Didn't forget the types of victories that God had wrought on his behalf. 
1 Samuel 22 and verse 1. David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I am saved from my enemies. Friend, if you consider, if you're a Christian, that's the God you worship. That's the God we're supposed to worship and look up to and depend on. Don't be afraid of whatever's challenging your faith. Fight it. Stand up. Because you've got a God big enough behind you to support you. There's a small amount of irony in that the Israelite army in 1 Samuel 17 was standing on a mountain. And so was the Philistine army. And the God who created those two mountains is the same God that said to that Israelite people, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And those people are afraid of a man down in the bottom of it. They forgot this. They forgot who their God was. David, thankfully, did not. And it was because of that that he was able to do what all of those Israelites, Saul included, was not able to do. So when I look at David, I want to ask, well, how, how can I get like that? I'm not there now. I'll admit that to you. But so how do I get there? What do I do so I can be like David? So I can fight like David did. So I can go out and I can defeat a spiritual giant like Goliath. Three things and the lesson will be yours. Number one. David called to mind the covenant that Israel had with God. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 26. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The Israelite people had something special that the Philistine did not. And David said, that's enough. That's the reason why I can go out and defeat him. I'm not fighting against somebody that has the same promises as I do. Friend, if you want to focus on God like David did, you have to call in mind the covenant God has made with each and every one who would have faith in Him. What types of things has God promised us? What has God promised you that He would do? If you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. We're going to read that text and then we'll have a couple of other verses past that in the same point. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. This is one of those points in Scripture where a chapter break happens at the wrong spot. Because the same thought continues into verse 7. Or chapter 7. 2 Corinthians the 6th chapter and in verse 16. Paul is making an argument here. They are the temple of the living God. They're supposed to be acting like it. Verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Well, none. They're not supposed to be that way. We're continuing on. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said. Now he's going to make some quotations from Old Testament passages. The first one's from Leviticus. That promise is a very old one. Continuing on, I will make my dwelling among them and call among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. The next quotation is from Isaiah, a little bit for, further forward, but still a long time ago. What does it say? Verse 17, Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, promise number one, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. If you believe in God, you have to believe that He is and that He's a reward of those that seek Him, right? If you come to God, He will welcome you and He will be a father to you and you can be a child of His. Chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. You've been promised an awful lot, friend. You've been promised things that should strengthen you to fight. 
God's told us He would take care of us. We're told in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God says, be content with what I give you because I will never leave. I will never stop caring for you. A little bit further on in that same chapter, Hebrews the 13th chapter in verse 20. This is part of the, the ending of the book here as, as, Paul, as, as the Hebrew writer is concluding this work. Look at the types of things that are referenced here. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God's covenant is eternal. It will never end. The Lord will equip you to serve Him. Our service to Him is pleasing in His sight. Those are great and precious promises, friend. Can we focus on those as we seek to fight our Goliath? You know as well as I do the end of Revelation 2 and verse 10. Probably one of the best promises of all. Be faithful to death and I will give you the crown of life. Do not be afraid. Go out. Focus on the covenant if you want to focus on God. That's how we learn to focus on our God. We work on our covenants. Secondly, you guys know the old song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We'll look at that in just a second. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 37. I won't read that passage. We've read it several other times tonight. But two times... Once when, Paul, or once when David addresses Saul, and once when he addresses Goliath, he recognizes why he's going to be able to win. Because of God. Not because of how well he's armed or his own experience. You might know the chorus to that old song by heart. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. What is the writer of the song saying? If you keep your eyes on God, all this other stuff is going to fade out. It's not going to be as important. It's not going to matter as much. And it's certainly absolutely true. Instead of dwelling constantly on how we've been defeated and how we're going to be defeated, focus on the one who wins battles today and tomorrow and forevermore. We read from Numbers 13 earlier this morning, the account of the ten spies, or the twelve spies returning from the land of Canaan. And the ten faithless spies, they came back and said, Oh, we are grasshoppers in their sight. There we can't win. Why was Joshua and Caleb's response different? And how was it different? Thankfully, the scriptures tell us in Numbers 14. Numbers 14 and verse 6. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Japuna, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. Notice what he says next. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Joshua and Caleb don't come back and say, well, those guys were lying. They're not really giants. They came back and said, if the Lord's on our side, we have no reason to be afraid. And that's what we have to learn how to do. We have to learn to turn our focus on the God that can protect us and save us and give us victory. If we'll do that, friends, then we can have victory. Paul in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. You remember he told us that these things that happen here on earth are light and momentary. But they're preparing us for something way better. Light and momentary contrasted with eternal and weight. Something small for something great. Focus on God. 
like David did. Focus on our Lord like David did. Thirdly, we have to recognize from Scripture that there is great power in the idea of a precedent. You remember when David explained to Saul that God would save him. David explained it to Saul on the basis of precedent. On the basis of what God had already done for him. God saved me from the paw, from the mouth of the lion, and from the mouth of the bear. Therefore, the giant, there's nothing to worry about. David came at this from the idea of what has God already done for me. In our legal system today, a precedent is probably the most powerful argument you can make. The idea that once you've proved something, you don't need to demonstrate it again. It's already been proven. Has God not proven himself to us yet? I would submit to you that he has. Psalm 66, the writer there would say in verse 3, Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and praise, sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Verse 5, come and see what God has done. If you look and see what God has done, friends, you will not come away empty handed. You will come away with more than you can ever possibly imagine. How does that help us? If we focus on what God has already done for us, what He can do for us is already proven. What greater thing did God do on our behalf than to send Jesus Christ? And not only did He send Jesus Christ, but He sent Christ while we were still sinners, Romans the 5th chapter tells us. While we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Friend, if God never did another thing for us, He has already done more than we could hope or think for. And even past this promise, He's given us so much. Shows His love for us, it says there in verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You want to learn to focus on God like David did? Focus on what God has done for you already. Instead of being worried as to whether or not He can do it for you again. He is faithful. He cannot lie. He will absolutely protect us and save us. Now we want to recognize a few of the, the obvious truths. When David invoked the name of God, did Goliath get weaker or smaller or drop any of his weapons or turn and run away? No. He stood there and took it on the forehead like a good soldier supposed to. But he didn't run away when God's name was mentioned. Are our problems going to run away when we mention the name of God? Is Satan going to run away and stop tempting us when we say we're on God's side? No. But what God's telling us is we can still win that fight. We can still have victory. The writer of Psalm 27 put it, Verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's not a question. That's a point he's making. Who have I got to be afraid of? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You have a choice tonight to be one of three types of people. <clears throat> The cool thing is we've talked about these three people already tonight at great length. You can either choose tonight to be an Israelite, you can choose to be Saul, or you can choose to be David. How would you be an Israelite? Any Israelite present that day on that mountainside could have stepped out and challenged Goliath. This wasn't a 10-minute affair where Goliath comes out and challenges the army. It's been going on for 40 days. And at any point during those 40 days, an Israelite soldier could have stepped up and won that battle. They didn't step out there because they didn't trust in the God that was on their side. What other conclusion can you come to? 
They didn't believe what God had told them about trusting in Him and believing Him and obeying Him, so they didn't do it. Do you believe God enough here tonight to obey His gospel? Do you believe in the God that sent Jesus Christ enough to put your faith in His death? If you do, there are some things that need to happen. We are told in the New Testament we need to confess the name of Christ before men. We declare what God has already said about Jesus, that He is the Christ, that He died on our behalf. If you believe that, you need to be baptized to come in contact with His blood, to receive that redemption, to receive those rewards that come from being a soldier of God, to have a place at His table. Those Israelites that day didn't step forward and fight Goliath because they didn't believe God would save them. If you don't obey the message of the gospel, can you truly claim belief in God? Can you claim biblical belief in God? If you believe in God, what's going to stop you tonight from obeying His gospel? Secondly, are you going to be like Saul? Saul had all the tools required to fight a battle. He was the biggest and best Israel had to offer. And yet he cowered in fear. Saul had been anointed as God's chosen king over the people of Israel, but he had forsaken God, and as a result, God had left him. If you're a Christian in this room, and you are inactive for God, Perhaps even in utter defiance of what God has told you to do. Understand that unless you return to God, you're going to have all the victory that Saul had that day. Which is absolutely none. Saul never returned to the Lord. But you can. You can return to God. You don't have to cower in your tent anymore. You don't have to hide from people anymore. You can come back to the Lord and say, I want to fight on God's behalf and He will take you back and put you to work for Him. It doesn't take much, but that's what it takes. Thirdly, you could be David. Now my boys get excited when I say you can be David because that means they can go out and get rocks and throw them at one another. How could you be David tonight? In just a moment. And during that song, if you don't want to be an Israelite, and if you don't want to be Saul, that is our opportunity tonight to change that. To go from being a Saul, or go from being an Israelite to being a David. Would you do that tonight? Here's what I want you to do if you want to be a David tonight. When it was decided that David would go fight the Philistine and the Philistine came forward, it says in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 48, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David was ready to battle on God's behalf. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't hesitating. There were no excuses. There were no reasons why he shouldn't do it. He wasn't shoved towards Goliath. He ran willingly towards Goliath. If you don't want to be a Saul or an Israelite, you need to run towards God. You need to run quickly. You need to make that happen tonight. Do not do do like David did. Don't let your family stop you. Don't let those who you look up to stop you. Don't let the devil frighten you into inaction. Run towards God. Come forward today if you would. Please come while we stand and while we sing. I invite you to come.